Boy, it's just so exciting to have this time together. Just us girls to talk about what we suffer with. I, everybody's asked me, how come men don't have men's meetings? Because they wouldn't come. <laughs> you know, their whole focus is making us happy, you know? And uh, every, each one of us, we're so different that how can a man learn how to make a woman happy? Because we're all so different. So he's got to learn you. But really and truly, I think one of the main reasons why God, in, God made it happen that we started having ladies' meetings in America is because we women, our focus is having a good spirit in the home. You know, and, that's what, and, and, and we're such the spirit of the church, too, that it makes it so important for us to learn, um, learn how to have a good attitude. You know, I'm not naturally an upbeat person. I know the people think I am, you know. I have to think about it, you know, I have to on purpose say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be upbeat when I get to that meeting, and I'm going to talk to people and make them feel good, and I'm going to make them feel welcome. You know, I just sort of take that on. But uh, it's easy for me to, uh, to not do that because I have people in my life that push my button. That was easy. You have people in your life that pushes your button? I'm not talking about a good button. I'm not talking about button, a button that makes me happier. <laughs> I'm talking about when they push my button. That was easy. And it makes me mad. <laughs> or I'm talking about when they push my button. That was easy. And it makes me hurt. You know, they hurt my feelings. You know, who cares about the Bible when it says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Amen. You know, when you push my button. That was easy. I get offended. You hurt my feelings. Well, that's because I have such a, 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 I'm a, a made of flesh. I'm, I have this n old nature that makes me ha ha my button get pushed. So I have a problem with fear. And I, I, what I have learned to do, I have a very uh, hard background. I have got a lot of troubled uh, people in my past and people that abused me and took advantage of me, people that hurt me horribly. And I could have lived the rest of my life uh, down and out. I could have been living the rest of my life reacting to everybody because of the hurts of my past. Or I could choose to overcome those hurts and, uh, and live a life, a victorious Christian life through Christ. See, we all have access to it, but some of us haven't learned the key to it. Well, one of my keys has been for years is that I'm very aware of why I do what I do. Now, think about that for a second. You know, when I, when every time somebody says something to me and it hurts my feelings, I step back and instead of just getting mad at them or getting my feelings hurt, I step back and say, now, why does that hurt my feelings? You know, it's not just because they're being mean. Because people are mean all the time. You know, it's because of fear that and easy. how it mo moves me. And I'm going to talk about two of those fears today. And hopefully God's going to use it in your life like he's used it in my life to help you be a better you. That's my whole goal. You know, if, if I have a Christian Womanhood magazine, and I do, each month I put a lot of hours in making this magazine available for women to work on their attitudes and their life relationships. If I have that, it's not because I've got nothing better to do. You know, if I take the time to go to these ladies' meetings and spend money sometimes to get to them, it's because I want to make a difference in your life. And so I hope that God will give me your heart right away. I hope that he will touch your heart as only the Holy Spirit can do, walking through these aisles, to help you understand what I'm saying and to get this simple truth about fear and how it moves me. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for these ladies that they'd be willing to come to this meeting. Thank you for the ladies that are going to be watching this in the future on the, on the Internet. I pray that you bless them and help them to be, have open hearts and listening ears to hear you speak to them through your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You see, our deepest fear is, the lo is losing connection and control. And let me tell you something about this button. Only people that I love and respect can push my buttons. You know, if I don't know you, and I don't care about your opinion on me, you can't push my button. Take for instance, uh, my family travels 
we travel on evangelism. We've done it for 25 years. If I look old, it's because I've, I've gained all these wrinkles from traveling it, for 25 years. I've told people for years the reason why God put my husband in evangelism instead of being a pastor or a youth director or something like that is because he knows there's not a church that could stand to have me for more than three days at a time. <laughs> so we travel from place to place all the time, and I love coffee. I mean, I just love it. You know, I, I've dr probably drank four or five cups this morning already, and I, I love coffee. And so we had gotten up one, one day early, and I have a truck, and uh, at that point, in that, those years, we had a truck and a travel trailer. And um, my husband said he was going to pull off to a truck stop to get fuel. And when he said that, I said, can I go and get me a cup of coffee? It had a McDonald's. I happen to enjoy McDonald's coffee more than anything because it's so hot. I don't care how it tastes. It's so hot. I like the hotness of it. And, um, so, and plus, years ago, a lady that worked at McDonald's told me that you didn't have to really be a senior to get a senior discount. <laughs> Did you all know that? They don't card you there. <laughs> you know, so I, for years, you know, I just, I'd go in and I, even before I turned 50, I'd, I'd ask for a senior, can I have a senior coffee? Now, it hurt my feelings when people did it without asking me, are you really a senior? But I got past that. It didn't push my button because I wanted the discount. But anyway, so I, we, I went into this truck stop. I have an, I don't know about you, but I am very opinionated. Can you tell I'm a pretty strong personality? And I don't know what it is, but when I go into a fast food, I walk in and I kind of know, I'm very decisive, I know what I'm going to get when I walk in that fast food. I mean, how many of us have been to McDonald's? We've seen that menu dozens of times. I have noticed, it's like an epidemic. I walk in and they got this new thing where people, like this is the cash register where you order, and there's way back here, you know, they're in line, but they're way back here. It's like they're afraid to go up there too soon. You know, I, I just want to push them up there and say, come on, let's get with it. You know, when you're there, it, it'd save at least one second for you to all be close. You know, what? that's my mind. I think that way. I'm too practical for my own good. But anyway, so I went into this McDonald's and there was a lady standing back here and she was looking at the menu. Now, I, two counts against her already in my mind. <laughs> Looking at the menu, who needs to look? Number two is standing way back here. So she's standing back there. So I thought she was trying to decide what she wanted. So me and my little bouncy self, I popped in there and I walked up there and I said, I'll take one senior coffee black, please. And all of a sudden I heard a voice behind me say, well, I never. <laughs> now I did hear that. And I care about my testimony. You know, I go to y'all's churches, and I, then sometimes I drive your church, you know, van around because we don't have a vehicle. And, it, you know, it's got your testimony is affected by my actions. And then I pulled in the parking lot in this, to get fuel, and it says Roundup Ministries. And so I'm, I'm thinking I had better protect my reputation. Yes. And even though I don't care about her opinion, i got to act like I do. <laughs> <laughs> so I turned around, and I said, ma'am, I said, were you ready to order? And she said, yes. And so, Mrs. Evans taught me this. You know, you got to give people the reaction that they want, not the one that you want to give them. <laughs> right? And I have recently been thinking so much about the word respond and respect and react. My pastor's wife in, uh, at First Baptist Church in Hammond reminded me of this a, f a month ago, and she said, you know, when, you, when the people, doctors give you medicine, and they, they, you, they come back a week later and they say, how did you respond to the medicine? Because when you respond to the medicine, it helps you, right? It's working with you and to help you fix whatever your problem is. But if you react, it means it's bad for you and you shouldn't take that medicine, right? So I am now, since a month ago, I've been living my life trying to make sure I respond to people instead of react. <laughs> You know, so this lady, I could have reacted and told her how stupid she was for staying away back there. <laughs> you know, and I could have said, well, you, didn't, you were standing back there, and I thought you were, didn't know what you wanted, so I come on. I could have explained all that to her, but I didn't need to do that. I needed to respond to that, well, I never. <laughs> so I turned to her, and I said, oh, I said, forget my, or I, I actually did this, and I, and I always exaggerate my actions when I'm trying to make people feel like I care. <laughs> So I said, just forget that order. And I stepped back and I said, go right ahead. I mean, just go right ahead like that. And she went. 
and she told her order and I stood back there smug. I was feeling pretty good about myself. <laughs> well, you know, because I thought, you know, I gave her what she wanted and I felt pretty good about myself because I didn't react to her like I wanted to, you know, in my fighting days. <laughs> you know, you look at me wrong and I'm about to ready to fight you. My brother, I got in the flesh a month ago. I was, my brother lived at a, a nursing home the VA Center in Martinsburg, West Virginia, and I was home visiting with him, and they have a smoking room there. It's not white walls anymore, it's yellow walls, you know, because of the, all the smoke and nicotine. Well, he was in a wheelchair, and I took him over to the smoking room, and I sat there with him, uh, you know, and uh, a man came in, and, it, it, and that man backed into my, my, man with his wheelchair backed into my brother. You know, he pushed my button. Because I thought, what are you doing, put, you know, backing into my brother? And so he put, backed into him, and I said, oh, and Loretta, don't, don't react. Just, you know, my lesson about res responding. So I said, just let it go. And so I smiled at him, like, get away, buddy. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> so he went, oh, wait, you know, when he messed up and hit my brother, he went over to the other side of the room. Well, then, for some odd reason, I started seeing that he had a feelings toward my brother. My brother was not communicative to people. You know, he just wouldn't talk to people. You know, and that man eventually came over and he backed into him again. And I said, sir, you know, you're, you're hitting my brother. And he said, well, he doesn't do anything, but he don't talk to anybody. And, eh, eh. and he just started spewing all this stuff out. I said, I think we're going to leave. And I just took him out of there. But, you know, that reacting wouldn't have helped any. You know, but what I'm telling you is my fights, my, I still have it in me to want to fight people. I am in the, I am still a flesh, I live in my flesh. You know, I could have beat that little man up in that wheelchair. I wouldn't have felt guilty about it. I would have thought he asked for it. But praise God, you know, I didn't let him push my button. to me. But do you understand, when I was growing up, that's what we did. You touch me, you look at me wrong. You know, I, I remember as a young girl, I pulled an, a switchblade out at, at a boy who was, who was hitting me in the back of the legs with a thing. I said, I'll cut you from side to side. <laughs> and he knew I meant it. It was pretty stupid that I did that because when I was walking to school and I was right across from the county jail. <laughs> now, as an adult, I look back and say, I was so stupid. You ever look back at your childhood things, you know, and think that way? So. Only people that I love and respect can push my buttons. And really, people, when I love and respect you, I fear you. I fear you separating from me. I fear you not liking me. I fear you not wanting to be connected to me when I love and respect you. So um, when, my, when my family members, we have a, a tr troop of people that travel with us. I have three adult children. And uh, it's a daughter, a son, and another son. The daughter is still single. The son, the second son is married with a little baby, three-year-old baby, and she's got another one on the way. And then the, the second son just got married in March, and um, they all travel. We all travel together. That is eight people, counting the little kid. Uh, that's eight people that we have to meld our personalities together. Now, let me tell you something, ladies. If you have a son, you better love that daughter in law that he married. You better fear that your relationship with her might affect him coming around you. You know, so those two daughter-in-law, they're important to me. Now, one of the things that happened when my, fir fir my son first got married to his wife, Barb, is we have a meeting. Our, our team meets together and talks about what we're going to do that week and all that sometimes. And um, I didn't know it. You ever, you know, when you have a family, you don't know what you do to each other, right? And so when that first girl got in the family, we noticed that uh, she took me aside and said, Mom, she said, you all don't let me talk. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean we don't let you talk? And she said, well, I'll start to talk, and somebody else will interrupt me and start telling their idea, and then you all just talk all over each other. You know, I, I didn't even realize we did it. You know, y'all have things like that in your family that you all do and grew up doing, didn't know you did it, you know? Or somebody will start talking and we'll finish it for them because we know what they're saying. And we think they're going too slow for us and so we want to help them along, you know, all that. Well, this little blonde-headed sweetheart, she got in the family and 
she's more, you know, she thinks before she talks. Isn't that weird? You know, think before you talk, you know. So she told, when she's talking to me about this, I thought, we do, we do that to each other, don't we? And I laughed. <laughs> I try not to laugh right in front of her, but I did laugh later on. I thought, we have done that for years, you know. And then I started noticing that even when I'm talking on the phone, I'll interrupt people to help them finish their sentences because they're going too slow, you know. <laughs> So anyway, when uh, Barb said this to me, you know, we started trying to work on it whenever she's talking. And KW, her, her husband, sometimes he'll have to remind us, now, Barb's trying to say something here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, you know. And it's not like, you know, it's not because we're being bad. It's just, you know, we, it's just how we are. But you know what? Some of us use that excuse. That's just how I am. And if you don't like it, she can go somewhere else. Where's that scripture? Where's that scripture at? I never saw a scripture that said that. Paul said, I'm supposed to be all things to all men. The whole reason why I said to that lady, go right ahead. I'm sorry I did that to you. And, you know, and I tried to exaggerate it is because I, I was going against my feelings. You know, and I have to do that sometimes. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm sitting in church and it gets a little bit slow, you know what I mean by that, don't you? You, you feel like that right now while I'm speaking, don't you? But anyway. <laughs> When it gets a little slow, I'll, I'll sit there and go, and I'll make facial expressions to act like I'm listening better, you know, to try to get myself more into it so I can, you know, at least make him, that preacher, think I'm paying attention, you know. <laughs> so, but um, whenever Barb said that, well, then my son Joe got married this year <laughs> to this other girl. And so we have a meeting. Now, we've, you know, we've worked about Barb, and KW helps remind us. Everybody be quiet. Barb's talking. Well, we got into this meeting, and Katie came to our first meeting, and she sat there, and all of a sudden, I saw her little hand go up like this. <laughs> and my husband's talking, and her hand's just staying up there, and he's, I could tell, he, he didn't know what to think about that hand being up, you know? <laughs> because I don't know about you, but my husband, he's not, he, he's not the general person that cares about everybody's feelings in our family. <laughs> You know, I, I, if I take him aside and talk to him about it, he does care, but I have to explain everything to him because he's just oblivious, you know, <laughs> of all of that. And I don't, ex and you know what, I don't expect him to understand all these feelings and emotions. You know, some of us expect way too much from our men. You, you know, we just expect way too much from them, you know. So, um, so the hand was up and finally he called on her and she explained later on after we left the meeting, I said, Katie, what were you doing? She said, well, I knew better than to try to talk when you all were all talking to each other <laughs> until I got the floor. You know, I thought, isn't that fun? We've been working on this for three years with this new girl, and we still haven't got it down. <laughs> but you know what? We make, her, we make Barb feel like we care. That was easy. Because I don't want to push her button. My son says he's called to travel in this ministry with us. And I could affect him being in God's will by how I respond to his wife. Some of you don't realize this, but you are driving people away from you by your reactions. Just because that was easy. they push a button for you. And when they push your button, you just react instead of thinking through how you're supposed to respond. Now, let me explain something to you. I have two balls up here. The first ball, I just picked two fears that I have. There are, I've got lots of fears. You know, fears that I, some of them I wouldn't even discuss in front of you because I don't want to hear, I don't want the devil to hear me talking about my fears, you know, because then he'll play on my fears more. So um, the first fear, and I put it on a ball because I want you to uh, think about grasping that thought in your mind, you know. Uh, the first fear I'm going to talk to you about is being devalued, being devalued. Um, that's what I wrote on this ball, being devalued. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So what I'm saying to you is this. I, I have to work at bringing those thoughts into captivity when somebody pushes my button and you have to also because if you don't what's going to happen is you're just going to be reacting all the time and your relationships are going to be a mess there's nobody that came in this room this morning and you said I don't care what my family thinks I don't care what my church friends think you know, all of us care 
unless we're really a hardened person from our past. And then you really need to work on that. But when I feel devalued, I feel inferior. You know, I feel like I'm, I'm inferior. Uh, when we first started the magazine in 2013, I started the magazine up in January, and I just started it as a digital magazine, which meant it, come, it came to your email address. And after four months, a lady contacted me and said, I don't like your magazine. I want my money back. I felt devalued. You know? And I had to think, Miss Mitchell, I had to think, now wait a minute. Am I supposed to be, am, is my value supposed to be based on what that woman thinks of my magazine? Do you understand? We, we got, I said I care about what people think, and then I'm saying to you now, let's be careful about what we put value on and whose opinion matters the most to us. When, uh, when I feel devalued, I feel inadequate. You know, I feel very inadequate. After that first year I started the magazine, I had somebody else, Jane Grafton, was, was actually mailing the, emailing the magazine out for me every month. Well, in April, April the 1st, April Fool, I was an April Fool that year, uh, 2013, uh, I said that I, I would send it out because of her job change and all that. I felt like she had too much to do to be involved as much in Christian womanhood. So that April the 1st, I am the one that copied and pasted all the email addresses in the email to send the magazine out. And you can feel very inadequate when you push the button to send those 500, at that time that's all the subscribers I had, 500 uh, magazines to 500 people, and you didn't do a blind copy. Those of you that know emails know you, when you're doing a mass email, you don't, put, you don't send everybody's email to everybody because then all those Mary Kay dealers just got 499 uh, email addresses that they could start hounding to ask them to buy for them. You know, I felt so stupid. You know, I felt so inadequate. Like, what am I doing doing this magazine? What, you know, who am I, you know, and all that. And then I had two people contact me. I mean, within an hour, they contacted me. Loretta, you sent it this way. And don't you know that's, you can't do that because you're supposed to do, you know. And I thought, oh, it all came in on me that day. Lots of weird things happened to me that day. It was a bad day. You know, one of those bad days. But I felt very inadequate. And, you know, there's some of you that you have jobs that God has given you to do, and you feel inadequate in it. You know, I know people, your preachers ask you to help in a Sunday school class. And because of your fear of yourself and your own inabilities, you won't help with that. He's not even asking you to teach. He's just asking you to come in and help round the kids up while the other teacher's teaching. But you feel so inadequate, you don't serve God in any way in your church. That's hard on you. That's because you feel devalued, uh, uh, feel like a failure. Um, sometimes whenever you feel devalued, you feel very unloved, you know. I, I don't know about you, but my kids have the power to push my button to make me feel like they don't care about me. You know, I, I happen to be very blessed to have three children and their spouses that, are, that love God. And they have not veered away from the path that we led them through when they were in our homes. But I'm, I'm just blessed that way. And really, to tell you the truth, girls, I think it's because we were their only influence. You know, we've been traveling 25 years. Jeannie was two years old when we started on the, you know, we were at your churches three or four days, but really and truly, they haven't had a youth group with any friends to pull them down. Their only friends have been Jane's daughter and uh, her and their family, and you, know, she's a pretty good girl, so they didn't pull her down, you know. So we've been very, they didn't go to school anywhere to have other friends to pull them down. They didn't have teachers to do wrong to them, you know. Human, they didn't have a lot of other human beings in their lives to influence them. You know, so I know the reason why my kids are living right is because years ago, I said, I, Kevin and I sat down, we said, you know, we're all they got. And if they're going to do right, we better be doing right. And we, you know, we stayed on our toes, you know. Uh, but I can feel very unloved by my kids sometimes. You know, when they make me, when they don't care about what I care about. Uh, sometimes we can feel invalidated. We can feel like... Uh, like we're, we could be in a room full of people and feel all alone. Well, um, whenever I, I help with a ladies' meeting that First Baptist Church of Hammond does in April, and um, the pastor's wife, Mrs. Linda Wilkerson, two, a couple years ago when she started having me, she asked me to be the MC 
you know, because I'm such a good talker, I'm sure. But anyway, she asked me to help in that way, and so I was doing it. Last year, I'm sitting in a, this year, I was sitting in a meeting in February, and Mrs. Wilkerson, she looked at me and she said, you know, Loretta, she said, I'm, I'm going to get somebody to help you do the MCN this year, and there's another person going to help do the announcements and all that. Now, automatically, because I want to respond right, I start shaking my head like this. Oh, good, whatever you want, that's fine. Now, in my heart, I was thinking, what did I do wrong? That was my, what did I do wrong? Why, why did that, you know, why doesn't she want me to do it? Did I, you know, am I too old? <laughs> you know, you start thinking all these thoughts because she pushed a button of fear to me. And so I, I said to her, because, you know, some of us limit our leadership around us by our reaction. Some of your husbands would never tell you the truth because they know you can't take the truth. And they can't. Men, men want peace. I don't know of a single man that says, I love to get my wife all riled up at me and get her fighting with me. I, I don't know a man that really feels that way. Now, you know what? Some of you married a man. And that man gets in your face. Or he tries to tell you what he wants and how he wants it. And you know what you do? You bulk. You know, and then he limits telling you the truth. And so some of you have got a kowtow. You know, he kowtows to you all the time. And, and if he, you know, if he didn't, you, you'd be so upset. But can I say this to you? I married a man. My husband, when he, don't, when he wants something a certain way, he tells me and he expects me to give in to him. Isn't he stupid? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but recently we got a new rig. It's a big story. It's such an exciting story. It, we got a new rig and uh, there's twin beds in this rig. Can you imagine? And my husband's a snuggle bunny. You know, he likes to snuggle every night, you know. So we have to get a piece of plywood and put the two beds together. So now we have a king-size bed. <laughs> but the mattress is hard. So uh, because of the situation, we had already a twin uh, foam, one of those foam things. And my husband wanted, wanted to put the foam on the twin. So the first night we were there, I put the foam on it. Well, I was down low and he was up high. It wasn't comfortable. Uh, so we took the foam off and I put it in the belly of the uh, coach. And, you know, he's just been saying, oh, my back, my back. And I'm in my mind, can I say this to you? And I, to I tell him, I said, think, what's wrong with you? You know, I, I, what's the matter? You know, what, why do you have to have everything so, you know, why do I have to have anything so fancy? You know what? Just be tough. You know, that's what I think in my mind. That's the wrong thinking. Do you know that? Any of y'all that think, yeah, you're right, that man. No, you know what? Let him be him. So just last week, you know, it's been a month or so. We got this rig, and he's been talking about his back hurt, and he wanted to put this foam on. Well, I, finally, I broke down. I said, Kevin, I said, those foam things are expensive. I mean, probably close to $100. I said, you know... We don't have $100 to spend on another piece of foam to make a match when you put them together. We're both even. I said, you know, let's just, and what, as I'm speaking to him, he looks at me, he said, you just don't care about what's best for me. And I said, I'm sorry. You know, and all of a sudden I thought, you know what? I really don't care. <laughs> and that's so bad. You know, that's really bad. I'm supposed to care. I married this man for better or worse, and I get the worst most of the time. No, 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 I'm <laughs> But anyway, so as I'm speaking to him about, we don't have the money, God told me. He said, Loretta, there's a lady that gave you a $100 bill for your birthday last week. October 24th was my birthday. And a lady actually handed me a $100 bill and told me to go buy something that she thought I needed. Anytime. You just come give me money all the time. I don't care. You can tell me what to do when it comes to buying stuff all you want. But anyway, so uh, the Holy Spirit smote my heart. And he said, Loretta, you got the $100 bill behind your driver's license, you could take that. Instead of getting that thing that lady said, she won't really care if you tell her the whole illustration. And so I took Kevin out Tuesday, and we bought one of those foam things. Was he a happy man? <laughs> but, you know, we got we to gotta do this for each other, for our leadership. Go their direction. Give in to them. Um, I have a, you remember I told you I got a, a grandson? Well, my daughter-in-law... I've raised three healthy children, you know. I've got three adult children. They're healthy. My daughter-in-law, when she got, had this kid three years ago, all of a sudden, I, you know, I don't know about you, but I sort of expected her to come, come to me and, and almost bow down to me. Ah, oh, mother of three. 
tell me your great wisdom on how to do this. You know. <laughs> do anybody relate to this? When that grandkid comes, man, you know, and I remember my my in-laws having all these opinions about whether I was supposed to take the kid out without a hat on. Do you know you remember those days? You know, and you had to wear a white t-shirt everywhere you went in the wintertime, you know, when you had a baby, you know, white t-shirt with a snap, it, it's very important. They even bought them for me to make sure I put them on the kid, you know. And so I'm remembering all these things when Barb gets in the family and has this child. And do you know what she does? She goes to this internet site called Babywise. Did you know Babywise knows everything? I don't know if Babywise has raised any children, but that, that internet, that, you know, Google and Babywise knows everything about that kid. I mean, when he gets a sniffle, she'll Google, what do you do when a kid has a sniffle? You know, she'll, because she wants to be a good mother and she's a first month time mother, she wants to learn all this. Now, let me tell you something. When she first started talking about going on those sites, I got, she pushed a button on me. That was easy. Because I thought, how come you don't even ask me? You know, I got all these unique ideas. You know, when you have congestion, you put Vaseline on your feet and put white socks on. You ever, anybody heard of that before? I got all these great ideas. Old wives' tales, you know. I, I made poultices and put Vaseline on the, uh, not Vaseline, I said Vaseline, Vic Sav. You know I said it wrong, didn't you? Vic Sav on their chest, you know, and burn the kids to death, you know. Uh, you know, I have all these unique ideas that are great that work, you know, and here she goes to the internet. Can I tell you something I realized after I first started, when she pushed my button the first time, I thought, now why do I feel that way, Loretta? Well, you feel like you know something. She's not asking your opinion. And Well, then I thought to myself, you know what? If she asks my opinion and then doesn't do it, I'll be even madder at the girl. So I think I'm better off to just let her go to the Google and baby wise. And, and if I, she does ask me, and if I give her my opinion, I just need to back off and say whatever you want to do and really mean it. You know, don't stand and watch and see if she's going to do it. <laughs> you know, if, I, if my value is based on whether my daughter thinks I'm smart, my daughter-in-law thinks I'm smart about the, the Internet, about this new baby, that's bad. Do you know what the Bible says in Isaiah 43, 4? Oh, I love this verse. I'm just going to do the first part of it. Since thou was precious in my sight. You know, the Bible says that. Thou, you are precious in his sight. I am God's kid. I'm precious to him. And my value should be based on what he thinks of me. And how I serve him. Not on my daughter-in-law's opinion of me. Not on my husband's opinion of me. But I, I, my value should be based on how God feels about me and being his girl. The second thought I want to give you about fear is uh, the fear of not being in control. I don't know about you, but I'm a control freak. I think I know how to do everything and I know how to do it well. And if you do it my way, it'd be great. I think you'd be very smart. I think that way. In every situation, I think I am right. When I, am, when I want to be in control, I, I have tendencies toward blaming others. Well, I can see why this happened because you did that wrong and you did that, you know, and I just want to make sure everybody knows how, what a mistake you made because you didn't do it my way. When I'm in control, I exaggerate. I don't know about you. Have you ever used those superlatives? You always do this or you never do this. You know, I love using those two words. You know, not because I've talked about this so much, I don't use them very much anymore. But in my early married years, Kevin, you always, and he'd say, always, Loretta. You know, he backed me down all the time. I hate that man. But anyway, so the fear of being in control. Uh, some of us, I'm sorry to say this, but some of us throw tantrums when we don't get our way. Some of you didn't get enough spankings when you were growing up. And you know what? If you didn't get spankings when you were growing up to get your way, you, know, you still want to get your way with your husband. You know, my husband's way is always better than my way. Now, when he says he wants to do it, I don't like it. Most of the time, I don't like it. Those of you that we were here at this church, you know, when he wanted to get that horse, uh, an evangelist friend, he says he's a friend. I've told him many times he's not my friend. <laughs> but an evangelist friend offered my husband this miniature horse to give him this miniature horse. 
so he could take him around, do tricks with him, you know, and do we need a horse? In my mind, it's bad enough we had a dog. You know, I'm not an animal person. You know what I mean? So, so when that evangelist friend gave Kevin that horse, I said, a horse? You know, and I said, what are we going to do with the horse? We're going to take him around. I'm going to teach him tricks, and he's going to give the gospel, and we'll see souls saved using that horse. I said, we see enough souls saved. <laughs> That's what I said to him. And he said, all right. I said, okay. You know, and so, I, but I, wanted, I didn't want him to get that horse. You know, most of the time when he tells these, you know, now one thing, I, I don't do tantrums. But can I tell you, I was with somebody that threw, threw a tantrum in the last six months. We went out to eat at a Golden Corral with a group of people. And while we were out to eat, uh, a young girl was, all the women were going to sit at one end, the boy at another. And a preacher was there. And this young girl moved over. I said, can you move over here closer here to give more room for the men to be over there? And so she sat next to me. And sometime during the meal, during, after we prayed, I noticed that she disappeared. I mean, she wasn't there. And I smelled under my arms. I thought, what did I do? You know, is it, she offended by my, my odor? Yeah, I didn't know. Really and truly, I thought, what happened? She didn't come back the whole entire meal. And I, I said, did I do something wrong? No, she's just upset with her husband. And I thought, I have never been that upset with my husband that I paid $10 for a meal and didn't eat it. <laughs> How about a witness? Amen? Yeah. <laughs> right? Well, then in the last six, mo- last six months, I was with a, a lady, and this lady gets upset with her husband because he didn't do what she, he didn't defend her the way she thought he should defend her. Well, he thought she was overreacting. So he didn't say anything to her. So she gets all upset with him and then won't talk to him for three days. I'm thinking, what are we, children here? These are tantrums because you, you know, you got to be, you got to ask yourself, what pushed my button? What made me mad? It's the fact that you want your way because you want control. And I, I, I'm just honest with you. I've read the Bible enough that I realized that I am not supposed to be in control. When I decided to marry this man, I relinquished control to him. You know, I am supposed to trust his judgment. And I, I think in the 30 years that we've been married, my husband has made some mistakes. I can list all the mistakes that I've made. I can remember mine really well. Do you know what it is about us ladies? We have a file cabinet. You, are you, you're going with me already, aren't you? And we pull up this, our husband's got his name on one of those drawers, and we pull open that drawer. And when he makes a mistake, we put a file in there, in our memory bank, and then another file, and another file, and another file. And then some of us, what we'll do is we will get very aggressive. All of a sudden, you know, he had just, I mean, he, 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 the straw that broke the camel's back. He said this, and all of a sudden, we just start spewing out. You did such and such two weeks ago, and you did this last week. And and he, I mean, he can't even remember what happened yesterday. He don't, those men don't have no filing cabinets, ladies. So to them, they don't remember how bad we are. Wonderful piece. (laughs) But anyway, but that's because we want control. I'm going to tell you, this is the silliest illustration I've ever given in my entire life. And I always wish that I could say this happened 20 years ago. But this happened this summer. I, we, we, went out, we always go out visiting on uh, bus routes with this horse. You know, he's got tennis shoes on, and we take him out into the neighborhood, and then people come in and look at him, and they say, oh, a horse, you know. Boy, when we were in Los Angeles, California, I, let me tell you, they had never seen it. There's people that attacked the horse because they hadn't seen a horse ever before, you know. Protect the horse, protect the horse. But anyway, so on Saturdays, that's what we do when we're going to have a big day on Sunday. So I went out with some other ladies, and Kevin took the horse with two of our kids and went out visiting. So I got home first, and I got home at a decent hour. I'm a very scheduled person. You know, Saturday, I had plans of working that afternoon on some projects. And so I got home at, tw- I said, I told the lady that I was out visiting, I got to be home by 12 o'clock, 1230 at the latest. And so I was home. When I got home, the other, some of the, the other kids that weren't with my husband got home. And so I made grilled cheese sandwiches because we always eat two meals together to try to save money. And 
we take turns cooking, the four girls do. And so I made grilled cheese sandwiches and I, I got it all made and I saw the time, it was 1.30 and Kevin wasn't home yet. I said, oh, surely, he's the, whoever he's with has stopped and got him some fast food and he's eaten, so I'm not gonna worry about it. So I cleaned up all the dishes and at two o'clock, I sat down at my computer and started typing. And I thought, oh, this is great. I got from two to five, you know, before we have to do another meal. I got three hours to get this work done. I got so excited, and all of a sudden the phone rang, and it was Kevin. I said, well, hi, how are you doing, baby? Is visiting going good? Yeah, yeah, it's going good, good, good. I said, well, I said, um, did you go eat? And he said, no. It started in my toes. Because in my mind, I think when it's 12 o'clock, you eat. You know, I got, a, I got an alarm clock in my stomach, you know, 8, 12, 5, 30. You know, that's just what happens, you know. So I said, you didn't eat yet? No. I said, well, can you stop and get some, you know, just stop and get some fast food? And he said, no, I don't want to. I said, what do you mean you don't want to? I've already cleaned up all the dishes. I'm sitting here and starting to work now. And I, can, you, can you just please stop and get something? Nope. I said, I got this horse trailer with me. and in the big car. We're going to come home. You're, you're going to fix us something to eat. And I said, I am not. He said, yes, you are. I said, okay. So I got up from there. You know how you do it. I'll fix him some food. I'll put some arsenic in it. You know, I am not having a good spirit at all. You know, and he walked in the door and, you know, he was kind of mad too. Did I even say he couldn't come home and eat? You know, can you imagine I did this? I, I think I'm such a wicked person. You know, and you know, I knew better. You, you ever do something, you look back and you say, I knew better than to get mad. What a silly thing to get mad at him about. But you know what the whole thing was? I wanted to control. He was interfering with my schedule. <laughs> so when he got home, I said, I'm sorry. You know, and, I, and here's your sandwiches, everything's great. And he said, I thought you'd get, come to yourself. <laughs> and we laughed. But isn't that terrible? That's a terrible illustration. And if some of you think, I don't blame you, Loretta, I don't, then you, that, you got the same problem I do. He pushed my button when he called and said he hadn't been to eat. And I thought, mm -hmm, I'm going to do this, and I got this plan. And, but you know what? We, we shouldn't want control. The Bible says in Psalm 25, 5, lead me in thy truths. If we're supposed to be in control, controlled by something, or something, if we're supposed to let the word of God lead us. The truth of the word of God will lead you, and it won't, it won't make you go astray. Some of you don't realize it or not, this, but when you are getting in your flesh, and you want everybody to go your way, and you want control, and you, people start pushing your buttons because they won't do things the way you want it, you're not following the word of God. You know, you're not being a biblical Christian. My whole goal, I think the way that all of us could have a better life have harmony in the home, stay married, rear up good children is by going by biblical principles. I have four, three questions I'm going to give you to ask yourself when somebody pushes your button. That was easy. First question, this is what I do to myself. I say, Loretta, what's the core reason why this bothers me? Is it because I feel devalued? Is it because I... Uh, what control is it because I can list all these things that, I, that I'm not going to list to you, but you've got to learn yourself. Some of you need to realize you are human and you are going to stay flesh and blood till you get to heaven. And you better know what pushes your buttons so that you can control your reactions to those buttons. Number two, have I ever done this type of thing to anyone else? Most of the time, what I think is when somebody does something to me, I think, well, I would never do that. Well, I hadn't done that, but I might have done something else. You know, we, we get so pious. Like, I've never done that. Yeah, but have you, have you done something similar to somebody else not thinking? Uh, then number three, the, oh, the verse for that is John 8, 7. So when they con continued to ask him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without, without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. You know, when you think you're so lily white and you never do that, there's other things that you do that are just as bad. Number three, how would God want me to react to this situation? You know, when I said, when I got to my, when I got up and started throwing things to make the grilled chili sandwiches, I said, you know what? Would God want me to react like this? I know that that old saying, there was a book out, What Would Jesus Do? It's a pretty good thought. We need to bring back that thought 
in our life relationships. How we treat each other, how we talk to each other, how we talk about each other. It, it, would, make, it would revolutionize our lives. See, Christ's example said uh, in 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. You know, he was really, people pushed his buttons a lot. But he suffered and didn't say a word. Stephen's example in Acts 7, 60 says, And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice. And I cannot imagine me, a human being, saying this out loud. But Stephen said it. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Stephen said that when they, just after they stoned him. And we get our little feelings hurt. And we start reacting and talking bad and fussing. The final thought for you is not a question, but a statement. The more you're in the Word of God, the more you're able to control your thoughts. See that verse said, bringing into captivity every thought and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. You know, you've got to bring it into captivity and control it. Hebrews 4.12 says, and the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So one of the things that I say to myself is, do I need to have a sandwich sign on today that says, I am not right with God? I haven't been in the Word, and that's why I want to react and do bad things to people and say bad things to people. You know, some of you... You should keep that sandwich sign on all the time. It would remind you to watch what you say. Be more aware of what intents of the heart you have to help you be a better you. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for these ladies. I pray now that you, I've shared my heart with them to try to give them this thought to help them be better for you. Now, God, only you can work only your Holy Spirit can tell them. And you know their lives. You know their problems. Could you help influence them to see the truth in their own lives? Now, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, who'd say to me, Loretta, God has spoken to my heart. And I surely can think of some things that I let people push my buttons for. Anybody like that? Thank you for your teachable spirit. Now, how many of you say, Loretta, I am going to sit down and I'm going to try to figure out what exactly pushes those buttons. I'm going to find the core reason in my own personality and try to start fighting them with the Word of God. Anybody like that? Yes. Thank you, Lord, for their teachable spirit and wanting to learn and grow. I pray that you'll bless them for it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.